All right, so we hear all the time things happen during the home inspection process, right? And um, it it ends up quote unquote killing the deal. Um, you what for whatever reason polybutylene happens? Maybe there's mold. Maybe there's a roof leak. Maybe there's something um, that happens, and it quote unquote kills the deal. Maybe the seller's upset, maybe the buyer's upset, it upsets the agent, and there's just a lot of different emotions coming into play. Welcome, Joyce. Uh, if you can hear me, uh, just go ahead and type in the chat that you can hear me. If you have any issues, just let me know. I'll be paying attention to the chat as well. Um, but to get started here, I just wanna go a quick little background about myself. So who am I? Well, my name is Aaron. I'm the marketing manager at Waypoint Property Inspection. I am a licensed home inspector as well. So I started doing home inspections when I was 18 with my parents' company. I did that for three years. So until I was 21, um, and I graduated college from the University of Central Florida. When I graduated from UCF, I graduated in business, and I decided that I really wanted to do marketing. Um, and it just so happens that I knew the owners at Waypoint Property Inspection and that they were looking for a marketing rep. So it was really awesome that we were able to connect and I was able to come over here to pursue that. Um, so now what I like to do is kind of like educate everyone about the home inspection process, really educate about real estate. I enjoy um, investing and investing in real estate. Um, but yeah, with that, let's just get started with the top 10 things that uh, could kill your deal. So the first thing is why we need to talk about this. Well, we feel the majority of the home inspection issues can be avoided um, with the proper preparation and communication. Secondly, going over these top 10 inspection findings that may kill deals can help you navigate through those rough waters whenever those happen. Um, I'm sure you've had it to where customers or clients are upset with you. Maybe they're upset with the sellers. Um, there's a lot of emotions just because there's a lot of money on the line and plus, People, when it's their homes, they have a lot of emotion tied to that home. So when maybe somebody is like, say, the buyer coming in and saying, you know, I don't like this, I don't like that, and I want this repaired and that repaired, it could really upset the sellers, right? Just because they have an emotional tie to the home. So going through these steps, hopefully, uh, when you reach some of these top 10 things, you can learn how to navigate these processes. So with that, let's just get started. And at any point, if you guys have questions, just shoot them in the chat. I'll be mindful to check that. Um, but yeah, so the first one is the roof. Obviously, that's a big ticket one, right? Going into the issues of the roof that we see, we see older roofs, we see damaged roofs, roof leaks, unprofessional repairs. Um, if a four-point inspection is needed, roofs today need at least five years of life left in order to obtain an insurance. Um, about five years ago, maybe even 10 years ago, it was three years of life. Now that's even bigger, which is insurance companies want five years of life left. I've heard some agencies say they can um, insure at three years, but it's got to be like a completely clean roof. Like there's got to be no issues with it, no evidence of repairs, no signs of damage, nothing. So the roof can be a really key issue that kills deals just because it's so people get so caught off guard. So in addition, roofs cannot have the following. They cannot have unprofessional repairs, any signs of leaks, signs of damage or excessive wear. So we have a blog on our website more about roofs, but this is how I would go about it. If I was an agent, if I was a buyer, if I was selling a property. So if you're buying a property before going under contract or showing a home, you should know the approximate age of the roof based on the MLS or the city permitting site or uh, the property appraiser site, right? So if you're in Hillsborough County, you can go to the Hillsborough County property appraiser and you could find the approximate age of the roof by looking at permitting information, right? Um, you can see the age of the home. If the home is 10 years old, more than likely they haven't replaced that roof. So you know, this is a 10 year old roof. And you can also type into our blog, like if I were to go to our website, right? And just search, how long does a roof last? you can see that most roofs in Florida last about 15 to 20 years. And those are shingle roofs. So knowing that if you have a 10 year roof, you have about five to 10 years of life left without any inspection, right? And then going into it, you can kind of prep your buyer. You can know your buyer and say, is this the type of person that could afford some repairs? Is this the type of person that can afford a replacement? So knowing the buyer's needs and the budget and prep them accordingly. 
right? It's so important to communicate that to them. Um, you can check our website for roof lifespans to see if the roof is a concern with other types of roofing materials, whether it's a tile roof, whether it's a metal roof, okay? So anything that you have, just feel free to email our office as well to say, hey, I have a listing coming up. The roof seems kind of questionable. We're not sure. Can you guys help us find the permitting? Whatever it is, we'll be able to help you out with that. If you're listing a property, speak with the seller on when their last roof inspection was completed. So consider a roof inspection and repairs if they haven't had a roof inspection in a while. Uh, roof maintenance should be completed yearly. Now, I know nobody really listens to that. Um, they kind of just think about the roof later and say, oh, I have a roof leak. Let me worry about it now once the roof leak comes. But really, you should have roof maintenance done every single year. If you're going to sell a property, just consider having a roof inspection done beforehand, because once you have that roof inspection done beforehand, you can prep your seller to say, hey, we should have these things repaired. For example, here's a really good example of what could happen is if you have a roof that's pretty old, you might run into a buyer that needs insurance and doesn't have uh, some extra money to just replace the roof. So if you're going into the deal and you can say, well, we know it's an old roof, but we have already had it had inspected and it, it's completely clean by the roofing inspector or by the home inspector that came out. So based on that, we're really confident that somebody can get insurance because they gave it five years of life left, right? So moving on from the roof, we'll go ahead and get on to the next one. Oh, suggest a pre-listing inspection, right? So last step, suggest a pre-listing inspection to your seller to understand what inspector would call out first. So as I mentioned, the same thing if you want to have a roofer come out to inspect the roof, or you want to have a home inspector come out, just do a whole pre-listing inspection to look at the roof. Um, I would advise doing a home inspector because a roofer will more than likely try to um, upsell your roof or try to downplay it. And home inspectors are looking out for the best interest of the next person coming in or whoever hires them. So if it's the seller or the buyer, they're going to look out for that interest, but also try and be honest and a third party where a roofer kind of has a little bit of a conflict of interest. So just be mindful of that. Um, a home inspector might say, you know, this roof really doesn't have five years of life left, but a roofer might come and say, mm, you might be able to stretch it. But the problem is the home inspector is the one that's going to the insurance company. So just be wary of that. So the second one, which is HVAC issues. So the issues that we see or the findings that we see is HVAC is older, it's not working as well, or it's not working at all. Home inspectors look for a temperature differential between 14 to 24 degrees. And what that means is if you have your AC running and you have the return or the air sucking into the unit of the temperature is say, let's say 75, and the air coming out or the temperature of the air coming out of the unit is say 65, that AC is only cooling the air by 10 degrees. So it's not cooling as well as it should be. We look for 14 to 24. So based on that, it would appear on a four point, it would appear on a home inspection report. So knowing this, it's really simple to just take a thermometer as a real estate agent to say, okay, what is the temperature going of the air going into the unit? And then what's the temperature of the air coming out of the unit, right? So like take a little thermometer maybe and stick it up in the duct and see what's the temperature of the air coming out. If the AC is older, say 10, 15 years older, this is probably gonna be a big concern. So we have more articles again on our blog about this. If you just go to waypointinspection.com, you can always just search like how long does an HVAC system last? And we have that on there as well. So going into what you should be doing about it. If you're buying a property, know the age of the unit and if it has been serviced recently. So if you're taking your buyer to visit a property, maybe you're about to put a contract into a property, how old is that house? If it's 2004 house, 2005 house, is the HVAC system original? Does it look old, right? Um, if it doesn't look old and it looks newer, then you're probably okay. But if it looks old, then you're going to say, well, this is a 2005 house. It's now, you know, 2021. So it's a 16 year old AC unit. That's really old, right? So it's probably not gonna be working as well as it could be, or the seller might have it just serviced. So that way it's working uh, for the time being, but maybe like once our buyer moves in, it's not gonna work well. So just be cautious about that. And then prep your buyers if the unit is older, or hasn't been serviced. Ensure budgets allow for servicing and repairs if needed. So you could go to the listing agent and say, hey, we noticed the AC looks a little old outside. Have you guys had that service recently? What did the HVAC tech 
say about that HVAC unit. Uh, from there, they can probably um, either say, hey, we haven't had it serviced, or yes, we actually recently had it serviced. Um, it's working well. There was no signs of leaks. Um, you know, they had the coils cleaned. Everything is looking good. And then you can kind of forward that onto your buyers so that way they can feel a little bit more at ease. If issues do arise, request the unit to be serviced. Um, HVAC systems should be serviced twice a year. And again, it goes along with the roof um, inspecting or in roof maintenance that I mentioned earlier, which roof maintenance should happen yearly. Um, but nobody ever listens to that, right? So the same thing with the HVAC system, it should be serviced twice a year. It should be serviced before summer, so that way your cooling system is working well, and then before winter, so that way your heating system is working okay. Um, and also, they can keep an eye on it for the coils to make sure the coils are clean and making sure that it has enough Freon and it's not leaking any Freon, so that way you don't run into any issues. Um, but if you, issues do arise when you're buying the property, just have the unit serviced, have an HVAC technician come out, look at the unit, and then see and weigh your options from there. If you're selling a property, so if you're about to list a property, right, and your seller has an HVAC unit, know the age of that unit and if it's been serviced. Ask the seller for all the documentation relating to the HVAC system. Ask if they know the age. Ask when their last service was. These are questions that we have to report as home inspectors on the four-point inspection report. So knowing these answers beforehand is going to be able to help you prep your seller or the buyer coming in before they get the home inspection reports or the four-point inspection. The last thing that you want to do is have, say, an HVAC system that you have no nothing about. You're ready for the home to close, but a four-point inspection comes back and saying that AC is not working well, and everyone just gets frustrated along that process. So have the unit serviced before listing a property if it has not been serviced in over a year. Uh, this just goes with doing due diligence and ensuring that it's working okay. Even units um, that are three years old, my sister had one installed, it was about say two years old, and it stopped working. Uh, it wasn't cooling as well, and they had to have a, a HVAC technician come out, add some Freon. So little things like that, you don't want to have these kind of surprises. So just doing the extra preparation beforehand can alleviate a lot of the stress. And then show that the unit has been serviced to potential buyers. So maybe with your documentation on the open houses, uh, maybe when they're about to put in a contract or requesting information about the home, you can send them that information so that way it puts them a little bit more at ease. All right, electrical issues. Let me get some water here real quick before we continue. So electrical issues is another big one. Right, We have tons of different electrical panels here in Florida. We have um, outdated electrical wiring. We have cloth wiring, right? Outdated electrical panels, electrical safety issues, or anything that could appear on a four-point inspection, right? So I like to ask this question. I have this picture here. Do we know what type of electrical panel this is? If you can put it in the chat and you think you know what type of electrical panel this is, please let me know. This is one of those panels that uh, we would flag on a four points or on a home inspection. And while you guys are thinking about that, I'm going to go ahead and try and pull up our blog here and share some articles with you as well. No guesses yet? All right, so I guess I don't have any guesses. Okay, well, the correct answer is a Federal Pacific Electrical Panel or an FPE panel. These Federal Pacific Electrical Panels are usually installed, installed in the 80s. Um, they're not installed anymore, um, but they are a flag for insurance. Uh, the reason being is because the breakers could still have electricity flowing through the breakers, even though they're turned off. Um, they could have sparking or arcing issues as well. It could just be an overall fire hazard. It's one of those things where the insurance uh, found a couple of these caught fire and based on statistics, they just want them all replaced at this point. So I wanted to pay attention or bring the attention to the blog real quick. So I'm just on waypointinspection.com. And what I did is I went to the blog section here and then I sorted uh, by categories and went to the electrical section. In this electrical section, we have tons of different information on the different electrical panels. So I have, say, fuse box, 
knob and tube wiring, reverse polarity outlets, or if I go to the second page here, let's see, cloth wiring, as I mentioned, outdated wiring is an issue. So all about that. And then we have our electrical panels that can cause issues. So the Challenger electrical panel, GTE or Sylvania Zinsco electrical panel, and you can learn how to identify them as an agent. And then the last one I mentioned, which is the Federal Pacific or FPE electrical panel. Um, you also have aluminum wiring, which everybody knows about as well, right? But if you click into these blogs, it's tons of information about why there are issues today and what you should really be worried or concerned about or why they need to be replaced. Most of the time with these electrical panels, it's usually for insurance um, and also just general peace of mind. Okay, so going back to our presentation. Now that we know, now that we know we have some electrical issues that could be concern, right? And it's one of the things that could quote unquote kill your deal. Here's what you should do about it. So if you're buying a property, look at the electrical panel, walk your buyer to the electrical panel, open it up and try and read that label. Okay. So most of the time they're going to be probably a square D, maybe a Siemens. Um, maybe you're going to find what's another one that I'm trying to think of anything really. But if you see Sylvania Zinsco, FPE, you see maybe it's a fuse box. It's not actual circuit breakers or a challenger panel. That's probably going to be a concern. If it looks outdated, if it looks old, I would be cautious of it. If you want, you can just snap a picture of it. You can email it to our office to say, hey, what kind of electrical panel this is? Again, it's all about doing the prep work. So that way, before you just go launching into a property and you're, your buyer is super excited, they know some things ahead of time that, hey, these things might come up. So look for GFCIs and two-prong outlets. We have uh, blogs on GFCIs and two-prong outlets as well. Um, with those, those are your ground fault circuit interrupters. So there's push button outlets in your bathrooms and your kitchens, and also your two-prong outlets. So most outlets today are three-prong, meaning they have the two on the top and one on the bottom. It kind of looks like a weird face. Um, if it, there's only two prongs to that, so there's not a bottom one, it means the outlet is not grounded. Typically, these are in older homes, and it has an outdated electrical wiring system for that, and there's no grounding throughout the house. Um, while during that time, it was considered okay, now we have updated electrical wiring to where we have grounding. And with the grounding, um, more than likely, insurance is going to ask for a grounding system to be introduced into the home. So if the home is older, has the electrical system been updated? You can ask the seller about this. You can see if there's any paperwork on this, any permitting on the property appraiser's website, right? If you're selling a property, so now if you're about to have an open house on this property, right? Maybe you're working with the seller and you're listing a property. You can, again, look at the electrical panel before you list the property, or maybe you're walking the seller through the home. You can look at the electrical panel and kind of see what type of electrical panel is it? Is it going to cause a concern? Look for those GFCIs and two-prong outlets. Is this going to be a concern? If it is, you might consider just replacing those outlets now, calling an electrician, right? Because otherwise, you're just going to run into the buyer having the same issue with trying to get insurance, and you're just going to kick the can down the road, right? If the home is older, has the electrical system been updated? Call an electrician or a home inspector beforehand. So if it's 1950s home, 1960s or 70s home, um, in the 70s, you have your aluminum wiring. If it's any of those times, even in the 80s sometimes, you might even want to call an electrician just in case. Ask the seller if they have an electrician before. How long have they been in the home? I know a lot of times maybe they say, oh, well, we, I mean, we've, we moved in in 2002 and it was completely fine. However, in 2002, just the things that inspectors were looking for then versus today are a lot different. So we just need to do the prep work beforehand. Uh, so that way, when the home inspectors come through or anybody else comes through, we don't have any huge surprises. So moving on to the next one, water intrusion. I have some awesome videos for this one, by the way. So these videos I'm actually pretty excited about. But going to the issues with water intrusion, these could be from roof leaks stucco leaks, plumbing leaks. And I have this cool little video, but I'm going to click one more and show the picture. So we're going to show this video real quick. And hopefully you guys can hear it. So this is a video of um, me actually when I worked at Honor Services. And let me play the volume.
So if you look actually, and let me go back one little second, you can see right here, there's a little bit of a bubble in the paint. So the roof was actually leaking at the eaves at this point and was leaking into the upstairs bonus room. Um, and we could see the paint was actually bubbled away from the wall. It was a little bit softer. It was a little bit cooler. So just walking around the home and looking for things like bubbling paint, peeling paint can show signs of water intrusion. I'm gonna go a little bit more into detail about this as we go along, but I wanted you to see this video. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. Let me resume the share. I, I paused the share. So let me go back here real quick. So I cannot see where you're showing. Screen is blank. Shows electrical issues. Okay. So I was going into the blogs, by the way. So I'll back up so that way you guys can see it. Um, these blogs, if you just go to waypointinspection.com forward slash blog, or you click on this blog link, right? And then the next step you can do is sort by the electrical category. So if I scroll down, I can sort by electrical here. And then I can go into, let's say, go to the third page here. And I can see all those electrical panels that could cause problems. Issues with Challenger panels, GTE, Sylvania, Zinsco panels, and Federal Pacific panels, right? So you can click on these and then read tons of information about these um, or about these electrical panels and why they cause issues. Going into the actual presentation, let me go back here real quick. So real quick, if you're buying a property, look at the electrical panel. You could have a Sylvania Zinsco, FPE, fuse boxes, or Challenger. So if you have any of those, um, just be on a on a on alert about that. Notify your buyer about that. Maybe text your inspector. Right. Look for GFCIs and two prong outlets. If the home is older, has the electrical system been updated? If you're selling, same thing. Walk your seller to the electrical panel. Look for GFCIs and two prong outlets. And if the home is older, has the electrical system been updated? If the seller isn't sure, if they don't know, and you're seeing signs like this system looks outdated, or I'm not really sure consider contacting your either electrician or your home inspector to find out. Um, if you have one of our inspector's phone numbers or if you contact our office and you take a picture of it, we'd be happy to tell you and say, hey, yeah, that's a, you know, a, a square D or that's a Siemens panel. So you're not going to have to worry about that too much. It's not one of those things that's going to flag for a four point. Or we'll tell you, yeah, that's an FPE panel. You should have that looked at. Okay, so water intrusion, as I mentioned, roof leaks, stucco leaks, plumbing leaks, and then this video, right? So going back into this video, let me come back here and I'll go ahead and hit play again. So this is the bump that I was talking about here and as well as where my hand is at. Um, this is just, again, some bubbling paint, a little bit of peeling paint that's showing where the roof is leaking at the eaves and coming down here on the wall. So this moisture meter actually sends electrons through the wall and sends it back. And then based on the number of electrons or the amount of um, electricity that flows through it, it tells us how much water could be potentially in the wall. So right now this is saying it's about 21% wet or 22% wet. Anything above and drywall, 14%, we usually say is kind of elevated. You, sometimes you could see as high as 16, um, but once you get to like 18, 19, 20, you know you have a problem and there's some water in that wall. Um, so knowing this, we can see that there's actually some water intrusion issues. And if I go back right here, you can see just the indent on the wall and looks like they recently painted and the texture is different as well. So looking at these signs, we can definitely see this is something that has been repaired before. So if you look at the baseboard right here, you can see actually some signs of cracking and damage. Um, and the caulk on the top is all cracked too. And the paint is peeling. So again, these are just other signs that could be wet. What's important to do when you see signs like this is look at the outside. Does it look like there could be water there? 
And if not, then maybe it's not wet. Maybe it's just natural, right? Because um, you'll need a moisture meter to actually know if it's wet or not. All right, so getting back into the presentation, water intrusion, what to do about it? So if you're buying a property, check for poor maintenance, check for poor paint on the house, on the exterior, check for a dirty roof, check for overgrown vegetation or high mulch. Any of these things can lead to conducive conditions that lead to moisture just staying up against the house, right? Or water intrusion by poor paint. Walk through the home and look for stains low to the walls around windows or on ceilings. So this kind of goes with everything else, right? If you're buying a property, take your buyer through that throughout the home, walk the exterior, look at the HVAC system, look at the paint, look at the vegetation. Is it overgrown? Is it well kept? These things kind of give us insights as to, is this going to be like maybe some water intrusion? Is the HVAC system old? How does the roof look, right? Does it look dirty? Does it look clean? How did, and tying this all together kind of paints a picture for us. So if you're selling a property, clean up the outside of the home, keep vegetation away from the home. So keep your mulch away from the home, right? Clean up all of the, uh, the vegetation, the nice plants, keep it away from the home just because if they're touching the home, you're keeping moisture and bugs against the house. Walk through the home and look for stains, low to the walls, around windows or on ceilings. So again, it kind of goes with you're buying a home. Take your seller and kind of walk through the home with them to look for signs of stains, right? Maybe some bubbling paint around the windows just to check if there's any water intrusion. Because looking at the stuff you're going to see and say, hey, this looks like a concern or yes, this doesn't look like it or no, this doesn't look like a concern. Now, the next one I have on here is mold. The issues, we have signs of microbial growth. We have people who have allergic reactions to mold, right? So what to do about this? And I don't want to raise concerns and like huge flags like, oh, mold is such a terrible thing, because a lot of times it's, it's actually not. Um, it really depends. The first thing that you should do is be sure to ask your clients if they have any known allergies towards mold. Some people are more sensitive to others. For example, you might walk into a client or a customer that says, yeah, actually my, my daughter or my son has a really tough time um, with her allergies and they are hypersensitive to mold. Um, this is something that's a big concern with us. If the home has been unmaintained, there's a higher chance for mold growth. If a home has been sitting vacant, right, and the AC has been turned off, uh, maybe the vegetation is overgrown, the roof has been sitting for a while. These are all, again, things that lead to conducive conditions that can lead to water intrusion and mold growth. Consider mold testing. This helps find issues before someone moves into the home. I would only advise mold testing if the client has known allergies towards mold, just because it can be so expensive. Um, so I wouldn't just recommend it on every single home, but if the house has been sitting, if the clients have um, issues with mold and are really hypersensitive and maybe have a lot of allergies, I would consider doing mold air quality testing. If you're selling a home, if the home has been sitting vacant, consider mold testing. If it is more likely um, leaks go unnoticed and ACs are left off, when, uh, which all lead to mold. So going back on this and kind of preventing a little bit, it's talking with your customers and your clients about these types of sensitivities, because the last thing that you would want happen is maybe a buyer to come through and purchase a home and say, um, after they purchased, you know, they've, they close on the home 30 days after they say, you know, we've been smelling mold, we're super sensitive to mold, and this is a huge issue. And now all of a sudden, there's a huge problem, right? Um, so asking these questions, maybe making it yourself a checklist for these types of things is going to be super helpful for preventing those things from occurring. Structural settlements. So the issues, older homes can have signs of structural sediment. Some newer homes can have signs of structural sediment as well. I have a Facebook video, but I also have this nice picture. So looking at this picture on the right, this was actually a picture on the east coast of Florida over in Melbourne or Satellite Beach area. Um, Melbourne Beach area. And if you look right here on the right, you could see the block has definitely shifted. And you could see a gutter that has been buried. You could see this slab looks relatively new and this huge piece of metal. This huge piece of metal is actually a um, repair job or an anchor that goes down. It's kind of like a huge metal pillar that holds up the slab uh, from shifting any further. 
Now you can see also on the gutter, what happened is the gutter didn't have like a proper downspout and a proper extension. It was actually just cut off right here. So a lot of water was just ponding in this location. And if you think of houses, just like when you're on the beach, right? And the waves come up and then they get underneath your toes and you fall in the sand. That's the same thing with a house. In Florida, we're like a giant sandbar, especially near the beach. So the same thing happens to homes. If you don't keep the water away from the home, the ho home can actually fall and settle underneath the sand, just like you're at the, the beach. Let's look at this video real quick. And I actually have an awesome little video that shows a home uh, that had some structural issues. So you could see what you can look for. All right, let me hit play. So you can see the ball is rolling. So the floor is slanted and it's going right up against this wall. We also have a huge level that we're using. So we could see the actual, uh, if the floor is actually level or not. Um, you can bring a golf ball with you, whatever it is to kind of put it on the floor if you have a feeling, but you could see the floor is definitely not level there. Now, some other things outside is I'm walking outside the property here and you can see a huge crack right here. So the slant was actually in this bedroom right up against on the other side of this wall. But that huge crack is just one of those signs that, hey, there's, there's something going on here. Now going outside, you can see actually the stucco has been completely repaired and there's huge signs of cracking here that are being repaired as well that are not finished. Uh, so again, just huge signs that there's been some movement here with this house. So this has been all repaired. You can see the gap in the lines there. And then if you go to the other side, again, this stucco on this side of the home has been repaired. It did not look the same on the other sides of the home. So before you go to list your property, before you take your buyer, right? And you sign that contract, walk around the property, maybe even after the contract, right? You can walk around the property to look for these things. Let's go back to our slides. So what to do about it? How to prevent it? If you're buying a home, if the home is older, you can check for signs of movement yourself, right? Doors not closing, cracks greater than a greater of, greater than a one eighth of an inch or slanted floors ponding water at the exterior. These are all things we talked about, right? And then check with your home inspector, hire a structural engineer for further evaluation. A home inspector is gonna be able to look at these things and kind of say, yeah, there's a problem. You need a structural engineer, right? But we're not gonna be able to fix the issue for you or tell you for certain. If you're selling a home, look for signs of movement when doing a walkthrough of the home, right? Ask the seller if they've ever noticed any cracking, if it's an older home. And when I say an older home, something that's like before 1980s. Now it could be um, a newer home that has issues. I've run into that before. However, it's really rare. It's not as common. And then consider a pre-listing inspection to find these things. So the next one is termites. The issues. Well, obviously evidence or signs of termites, right? Or live termites. I have a nice video of this as well. Um, let me go back here. I'm actually going to let's exit out here and pull up this video. And I'll pull up this one as well. So this is actually a video of where I was finding termites in a home. Um, so everything looks clean about this home, right? It's a little bit of older in a home. Looks like it's probably in the 70s just because of the pink here, right? But what I'm doing here with this actual stick is I'm just looking at the baseboards and poking them. And I'm hearing for a papery sound because when termites eat wood, it basically just turns into paper. It turns really soft um, and there's galleries behind it because they basically eat the wood. So if you look at this picture here, that's it. That's all you see on the exterior. But inside, there's actually tons of damage. And the carpet actually is new carpet. So they knew this was here, or maybe they didn't know like it was actually termites, right? But if I peel up the carpet, you can see all of the damage underneath the baseboard that was actually never seen. So just these couple dots are little insights and tapping on the baseboards that, hey, there was a problem. And what was happening here actually on why there was termites is on the other side of the home, the vegetation wasn't kept well, right? So the vegetation was right up against the house, but there's ponding water. 
So the ponding water and the vegetation just led to an area where water never dried out. Termites were underneath the ground, subterranean termites, and they came up and ate this wood that became wet just because we had an issue where water was come up against the house and was getting all this wood wet. So looking at this other video here, we have another video where we have some live termites. Um, so this is in the garage and they have some wood baseboard in the garage. Um, I really wouldn't advise this just because a garage sometimes gets more wet just compared to the inside of the house. But looking behind the washer and dryer behind this baseboard, you can just see and tell. So this again, just goes into little things like as you're going about to list a property, maybe you're walking your buyer through the property, just walk through and look for these types of things to kind of prep accordingly. Prep your listing agent to kind of, or prep your seller to say, hey, did you know anything about this? Or have you ever had signs of termites like this? Or prep your buyer and say, yeah, we should text some pictures to our inspector to kind of prep before this happens. So you could see some live termites here moving. Going back into it, um, this picture, by the way, here is actually termite frass or termite, uh, basically termite poop. Um, so this is from dry wood termites. So what to do about it? If you're buying a home, check with the seller to see if they have an active bond with the house, right? If they have an active, active bond, that's really great. That's really awesome. The type of termites can lead to different options. So if we have subterranean termites, you're going to have a different treatment option than if it's dry wood termites. So keep that in mind. If you're selling a home, keep your home maintained. That's so, so important. So you're not going to have any water issues. Keep the vegetation off the house. Keep the mulch off the house. All those things that lead to conducive conditions that lead the water just right up against the house and sticks there. Keep your bond active or treat the home. All homes should be treated. Okay, all homes should be treated, even uh, concrete block homes. Concrete block homes still get termites. Um, it's less common, or sometimes we've seen more common just because people don't think with concrete block homes they need to treat it, so they don't ever treat it. And then those are the ones that happen to get termites. And remove all elements of termites after treatment. So if you are um, maybe walking your seller through a property and you see some evidence of termites, maybe it's that termite frass, right? Maybe it's the galleries or damaged wood that you're seeing or anything like that. And the home has just been treated, remove that. Um, because if you don't remove that evidence, it's gonna show on the home inspection report, it's gonna show on a WDO report, um, and then the buyer is gonna be concerned about it, okay? So if you've already treated, you know it's clear, the other pest control company that came in to do the treatment, they should have already replaced all that, but if they didn't, you need to remove that. So next here we have grading issues. So grading that slopes towards the home and can lead to water intrusion, can lead to structural problems and can lead to wood destroying organisms like termites. So right here in this picture, we have a great picture that showcases, the, they have gutters, which is great, but the gutters just pour right onto the house. Right, so this leads to structural problems. You got some wood, some T111 siding that's definitely wet, can probably definitely lead to termites. So what to do about this? Again, walk around the home, check to see what damage could have occurred and if this is an old issue, fix it right away. If you have a grading issue where the, the ground slopes towards the house, fix that, add some dirt, right? Or remove some dirt in other areas. If you're selling a home, consider adding gutters and extensions. Fix the grading before inspectors arrive. If you know there's a grading issue, right? And you're looking at it, that doesn't seem right. Or we got a lot of ponding water right there. Call someone a handyman to fix it. There, Because the home inspector is just going to come out and see it. And then he's going to look into it further by saying like, well, we have a grading issue here. I'm going to check the wall on the other side to see if it's wet. Um, and that's what he's going to go to. So keep that in mind. Repair any damage left by poor grading. So if water's been sitting for a while, look for the other wall, see if you see any uh, peeling paint, some bubbling paint, maybe some cracked uh, baseboards, anything like that. Two more. So we have polybutylene. The issues with polybutylene, it can leak at the connections. Homeowners can struggle getting insur insurance, and it's commonly found in the 1990s homes. Uh, we should be cautious about homes with copper stub outs only. So in this picture here, this is actually a home I did a mold inspection on. And uh, because they were doing uh, remed remediation for mold, right? They cut out the wall. So this is the drywall at the top. 
And this is actually a vanity. So you could see the drain line was right here. So a vanity was sitting right here and this is inside the wall. They have copper stub outs coming out of all the walls and from the toilets. So from an inspector standpoint or your standpoint or the homeowner standpoint, they can't see that there's polybutylene, but there's actually polybutylene plumb throughout the entire house and it actually goes underground. So you could see how these come out from underground and everything else is showing copper. So throughout the entire house, we only see copper, right? We're gonna report it as, well, the house was distributed with copper, but some homes, because they wanted to appear more rich, right? Because copper was a, a more expensive thing. They did copper stub outs only and then used the plastic or the polyurethane, which is made a, which makes the polybutylene. They did that uh, where you couldn't see it. So what to do about it? If you're buying a home, a buyer may not really have a choice but to find a way for the poly to be removed and replaced. So if it's found, um, you're they're probably not going to have a choice getting insurance um, and they're probably going to want to replace for themselves anyway, just because it's going to appear in the home inspection report. So just keep that in mind. If you're selling a home and it's a 1990s home, uh, check with your seller to see what type of plumbing you have distributed, but consider a pre-listing inspection to find it first. If you have poly, be honest about it, work with a buyer if you cannot replace it yourself. So if the seller can't replace it, maybe they don't have enough money, Try to work with a buyer that can um, help them with the repairs or kind of negotiate that deal, right? Um, it's important to just be honest about it first because the last thing you want is a buyer to move in the property 30 days later, a leak happens or their insurance camp cancels them because another inspector came through or whatever it is, okay? Here's another picture of polybutylene. Um, this is a polybutylene manifold, which was actually like a electrical panel in the garage. So you can control all of where the water's going and shut, up, shut it off in the garage. Now, I wanted to go back to as well and go to our blog for this. So if I go back to waypointinspection.com and I can just hit the search and search poly. If I search polybutylene, it pops up with a nice blog. What is polybutylene? You can read tons of information about polybutylene, how to identify it, where you can check for it in different locations. These are things as an agent, I would be walking through with my buyers, right? Or my seller, I would walk through the home and this would be one of those checklist items, okay? That you can look, you could see different pictures of polybutylene, what it could look like. This is underneath the sink. So it's a gray pipe that's labeled PB2110. So you could see actually PB2110 in this picture. Um, here's that picture we looked at, but there's tons of information there available to you guys. Getting back. The last one we have is drainage pipes. So the issues here are cast iron drain lines. They were installed before 1970 and they're basically at the end of their life here. We also have Orangeburg drain pipes. So with Orangeburg, they're first used in the 1860s. They usually stopped um, by 1920. However, we still see them. So it's very rare, but it does happen. So it's common for homes to have partially replaced drain lines. So while home inspectors can see PVC, it may not all be replaced. So here's a picture of cast iron drain lines and actually the inside with tons of dirt around it, but what it looks on the outside. And then here's a picture of Orangeburg uh, drain lines. So Orangeburg is ba basically like a paper. It's actually a paper mache that's hardened and made into the drain line. So you can see why it wouldn't last that long, right? And then cast iron is a metal uh, however, it corrodes from the inside out, and it's just at this point way too old that it corrodes on the inside because the water running through it um, and, and then starts to crack. So what to do about it? What do you do about cast iron? What do you do about Orangeburg? Well, consider a sewer scope inspection if you haven't heard about this. It's basically a giant camera that goes inside uh, the sewer drain lines, and then we could see what type of drain lines are underneath the home. Because as I mentioned, sometimes people just do repairs and they repair everything with PVC, but not underneath the home, just because that's the part that's more expensive. So if you're selling a home, consider a sewer scope inspection to find the condition before you list the home. Decide on your best course of action after finding out the condition. There should be another question you ask your, your seller, right? I'm gonna ask them, hey, what type of drain lines do you have? Do you have, have you had any issues with these in the past, right? Uh, maybe you might ask them and say like, 
uh, if you did have them repaired, what, what happened during those repairs? Um, some sellers, they may say, well, I don't really know. Um, we moved in the property. It's been fine. And that's okay. That's when you look around yourself, just knowing at the age of the house, is it before 1970s? Then you might have cast iron. It's a really old house. You might have orange berg as well. Here's a picture of an actual sewer scope picture. Um, and this is a cast iron drain line. So this white around here appears to be PVC, but then further past it's cast iron and you could see all the vegetation. This is actually tree roots growing inside just because it's all damaged. So coming back over to our blog again, if you wanna search cast iron, if you wanna search Orangeburg, there's tons of information to where you can just click on the blog, read about it, how to identify it. Um, and tons of information. So if you ever uh, see it, maybe you're concerned about it, maybe you wanna read it just extra. So that way, uh, if you ever have a house that's before 1970s, you could be prepared for it, then you could read about it here. Coming back, these final thoughts. Um, the key is due diligence. The key is transparency for the smooth transaction. If you don't do anything beforehand as an agent and you don't prep your buyer, your buyer's gonna get super excited and um, then they're going to come, the home inspector is going to come through and tell them about all these issues, all these problems with the home, and it catches them completely off guard. So what you can do beforehand is walk through the property, look for these things, right? Walk your buyer through the property, look for these things and kind of say, hmm, this seems to be a concern based on, you know, the pictures that I've seen, the information I've read online. I'm going to snap a picture of this and send it off to my inspector just to ask, Right. And then that kind of gets your buyer to where start thinking about these things, right? The same thing if you're selling a home, take your seller, ask them questions about this, if they've had any repairs like this, if they've had the HVAC serviced, um, and then walk through, walk them through their home and kind of say, well, I would take your vegetation away from the wall or there. I would definitely add some gutters and extensions if you're going to stay in the home, right? Uh, because it looks like you have some ponding water, all these different things, because it kind of preps them for the home inspection process. Sometimes you cannot prepare for everything and repairs or replacement is needed. So just keep that in mind. Sometimes you, you just can't find things and, and you know it takes a home inspector to look in the attic to actually find that roof leak. Um, that happens, right? But the best thing that we can do is kind of prepare both parties before going into the process about what could happen. So for more information on any of these topics, you can visit our blog and it's just waypointinspection.com and then you could click on that blog button. Um, you can view our recommended contractors list in case you have any people where you say this something this is something that definitely needs repaired. Um, it's on our website as well. So if I were to go back, it's just right here under resources, recommended contractors. So that being said, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to chat them in the box below, but we're pretty much done. So I want to say thank you for attending our first webinar. Um, this, we actually had 11 people signed up. So it's awesome to see four of you here. Um, we're going to start trying to do these every month with Delta variant kind of going now. Um, and with everything else, as far as people not working in the office, we wanted to find a way to kind of bring the education out there to the agents at a time that is convenient for them. So hopefully you like this. If you did, please let me know. So that way I can, uh, do it for next time. Or if I, there's something we need to work on, please let us know on that. So that way next time, next month, we can do that as well. But that being said, um, I think we're finished here. Dr. Uh, Creaky, Dr. Carol Ann Creaky, thank you so much. It's great seeing you. Thank you for attending. Uh, you here, thank you. It's nice to hear you. Um, Lara, very helpful. Thank you. And Joyce, thank you. Um, and thank you for calling out. Uh, my screen was still paused. I'm sorry about that. Um, thank you so much, Martin, Kristen. I think it's Kristen Martin. All right. That being said, thank you so much, guys.